All right. Um, well, I think we should go ahead and get started. Um, sorry for the delay there. Um, we were just trying to make sure that we're set up for our online audience. Um, so uh, thank you for being here. Um, and thank you to the international section for sponsoring this session. My name is Sarah Jansen. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois. Um, and together with Ben Schwab here, I'm going to be moderating the session. Um, ben is associate professor at Kansas State University, also chair of the international section, um, and we've kind of jointly organized the session. So the purpose of the session as agricultural economists, uh, many of us, although not all of us, work at land-grant universities, land-grant institutions, um, and we receive hatch funds to conduct research. So in this session, what we wanted to do is discuss the ways in which international development research is aligned with the mission of land-grant institutions. So for those of you in the audience who aren't familiar with the historical context, a land-grant college or university is an institution that has been designated by its state legislature or Congress to receive the benefits of the Morrill Acts from way back in 1862, 1890, and then 1994. The Morrill Act was intended to provide a broad segment of the population with a practical education that had direct relevance on daily lives. And then 15 years later, after the original one, in 1887, Congress passed the Hatch Act, which provided for necessary, basic, and applied agricultural research to be conducted by state colleges and institutions in cooperation with the USDA. So based on my understanding uh, of these um, two acts, land-grant institutions have basically two primary goals, this is my view, but practical education, um, as it was outlined in that original Morrill Act, and necessary basic applied agricultural research, as outlined in the Hatch Act. So today's panelists include leaders in our discipline with a wide range of research interests, from domestic commercial agriculture to the economics of climate change, international trade, global food security, just to hit on a few topics. Um, and the panelists have been asked to ponder the ways in which international development research and education uh, meet the, those goals that I just outlined of land-grant institutions. So practical education, um, and necessary basic applied agricultural research. So the panel is structured as followed. It's, it's very informal. Um, there's going to be no presentations, no slides. We're, we'll kick it off with some initial questions to the individual panelists, um, and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. So hopefully it will just be a, a fairly informal conversation. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Ben to introduce the panelists. Um, they'll each wave at you from there, and then we'll have them come forward because we're stuck with one mic. So thanks everyone for coming. And uh, as chair of the international section, we have a lot of great track sessions uh, to come. And thank you very much for Sarah for taking the lead and organizing this one. So uh, our first panelist, Sally Thompson, is interim head of the Department of Agriculture and Consumer e Economics at the University of Illinois. Pr Professor Thompson was previously on faculty at Illinois and later department head at the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. She has worked as a senior executive at the USDA's Economic Research Service, and she led the U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau, U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis as the deputy director until 2018. Her research interests include the performance of commodity transportation processing and food markets, economic role of futures markets, marketing strategies for agricultural and food products, agricultural economic history, economic impacts of information, information systems, measurement of GDP and national income, and international trade and investment. David Zilberman has been a professor in the Agricultural and Resource Economics Department at UC Berkeley since 1979, where he holds the Robinson Chair. He is a past president of the AAEA, a fellow of the AAEA, and the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists. His research has covered a range of fields, including the economics of production technology and risk in agriculture, agriculture and environmental policy, marketing, and more recently, the economics of climate change, biofuel, and biotechnology. 
Titus Awokuche uh, is the department, is the professor and associate dean for research and strategic partnerships at Michigan State University's International Studies and Programs, ISP. He previously served as chairperson in the Department of Agricultural Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. Prior to joining Michigan State, he was chairperson and professor in the Department of Applied Economics and Statistics at the University of Delaware. He currently serves as an elected member of the AAEA Executive Board. His research interests and activities examine how international trade and food market liberalization policies enhance economic growth, improve, improve food supply chains, and promote food security in developing countries. Alex Winter Nelson is a professor in agriculture and consumer economics at the University of Illinois and serves as the director of the Illinois Agricultural Experiment Station, acting associate dean of research and associate dean of international programs. His research applies economics to better understand how we can alleviate poverty and hunger in some of the world's most disadvantaged places. He works in Africa and Asia to examine what technologies, policies, and programs are most effective in enabling poor people in rural areas to move themselves from, from poverty into economic security. Sally, David, Titus, Alex, welcome. Thank you so much for your willingness to be here and share your thoughts. Welcome them. <laughs> Got screwed over. You got it. Get some more friends. <laughs> Okay, so we're, we have some initial questions that we'll ask uh, online. We'll be monitoring a chat, I think. Ben's gonna monitor the chat. So if you have questions to pose online, feel free to do that, um, but we'll open it up to questions from the room after a little bit. Um, but to start off, our first question is for Sally. So Sally has been at the University of Illinois with me for the last six months, um, eight months, nine months. Six and a half, Six and a half. <laughs> wonderful months. Um, she's loved her, you know, her time in Illinois. But during that time, she's asked us to, as a department, to think about the land grant mission. And so I would like to ask Sally, can you share with us, um, you know, I opened with a brief history, but can you share with us kind of your version of kind of what is the brief history of the land grant mission that matters? Um, and what do you think it means for agricultural economists working at land grant universities today? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for inviting me to this. Although, when Sarah first invited me, I said, I'm not a development person. She's like, Good, that we want someone we can beat up on. So, no, she didn't say that, but that's that's really what I thought was going on. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. We're, I'm there with you on that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the land grant mission in part because um, uh, our new incoming president talked about it this morning and did a fantastic job. Um, but I just want to mention a couple points about um, sort of to prime the other folks for what I think they're going to talk about, about how um, sort of the punchline, in my view, about international development as it fits or, or not in the land grant mission. So the bottom line, of course, you didn't mention the Smith-Lieber Act, which is a very important part of the, the mission, which also um, adds the extension component and the various other amendments that were done in the 70s to include the 1890 schools, more funding and that kind of thing. But the, the teaching research extension, we Everybody in this room, everybody online, I think, knows a little bit about that. But the one point that you didn't mention, or, or I didn't hear you emphasize very much, is about service to the state. Service to the state where the um, land grant is located. and Or service to multiple states that have similar um, agricultural resource family and consumer. I mean, it's not just about agriculture. You know, the land grant mission is about agriculture, rural communities, 
uh, families. Um, and in fact, that's often forgotten, I think, at least at our institution too. Um, so all those things, but the, the important thing is it's very domestically focused, the traditional land grant mission. Um, but I think starting in World War II and some even before that, after World War II and some even before that, um, the land grant mission got extended to include an international perspective. Um, and, and why is that, it, that it got extended? It didn't get funded to do more of that stuff, but there's, there's sort of three reasons why it's in the interest of land grants to, to do international work in the land grant mission uh, sense. One is just to provide better teaching and education for the students and the faculty at those universities. So I was reading, in fact, uh, uh, my cheat sheet for a lot of this was Purdue University, where I worked at one time, has a great history on its website of its international programs in agriculture and ties it, Jerry put it together, and ties it all into the land grant mission. So he sort of wrote whatever I'm gonna say here. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so a lot of the early land grant faculty went to Europe to learn things about agricultural and agricultural techniques. And, uh, and then they brought foreign students from overseas to come learn. And then there's sort of this exchange and an internationalization of the curricula. I think that was a, a, a really important point, not forgetting the teaching side and the benefits to US agriculture and use the agricultural students of being exposed to international things. That's, that's consistent with the land grant mission and the educational side. Um, then um, uh, promoting US ag exports. Uh, there was a time when I started in the, nine, in the 80s, in the early 80s, when our deans were always asking us about, well, is the international work ultimately gonna support US agriculture? Are we gonna export more? Uh, is the point of raising those incomes overseas is so they'll buy more U.S. stuff. We don't talk about that that much anymore, but it, it, it comes and goes as a major theme. And if you get stakeholders in the state talking about it, they'll bring it up. Um, in fact, um, I remember, you know, there was all, all concern about we will never send another faculty member to work in Brazil again. That's what they were saying in Illinois in the 80s, because they were starting to eat our lunch on, on ag exports. So but that's still another reason for doing international work in the, in the land grant sense. And then um, the third one is political. USAID is, is, it funds all this stuff and it's you know a political arm of our, our country and to create allies ever since the Marshall Plan, and then in Kennedy started USAID. So anyway, um, I think the land grant mission, teaching research extension as applied to the states or states with comparable issues has been extended to include this international development and internationalization. I would consider it part of the land grant mission now. It's just not funded the rest of the way that uh, traditionally the states would fund and the Hatch and Smith Lever money would fund the other components of the land grant mission. But anyway, maybe that's a little more than, but I, I, I didn't think I needed to remind people about too much what extension was in research. Do any of the other panelists want to add anything in terms of the historical context before we move on? No? Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, um, you seem to be leaving out Title 12, which was passed in 1975, and was an explicit effort to try to build what was called the fourth function of the land grant university. In fact, the philosophy behind it is we want to have the people of Lennox and Paul from England and Hubert Humphrey, and they wanted to establish this fourth function uh, legitimized in federal legislation. And even at that time, they thought they were going to be able to get state participation. 
one of the big disappointments that that law did not elicit state government participation in foreign assistance, even though they were trying to show that there was uh, a reason for states and local constituencies to be partners with the federal government in that effort. Thank but you. that Title 12, you know, has been revised in 2000, and it is highly explicit about the role of land-grant universities in U.S. foreign assistance. And, you know, it names the functions, it identifies agriculture, it even includes consumer sciences. So there's, there's a lot on the books that have, that have provided for the engagement of land-grant universities. Oh, one problem in passing that law was that we couldn't use the term land-grant, but we said, uh, eligible universities were defined as those that have the function, the tripartite function of teaching, research, and service, or extension. And then there was a debate as to whether or not uh, uh, the, the uh, Stanford Food Research Center and, and Stanford University qualified. And they said, we do extension too. So it was a big debate. Uh, on you know not online on the phone in which, this, <laughs> in which this is resolved and the law was changed to, to uh, write an extension with a lowercase e. Well, that's where that, that comes from. Uh, and, yeah. and to further say you know sort of define what that means so that other so eligible universities but it's the it's the responsibility of BIFAD of oh that law sets up the board for international food and agricultural development. And under BIFAD, BIFAD is supposed to establish a roster every year of all eligible universities for U.S. and in the federal government partnership. So anyway. Thank you. I, I knew about BIFAD, but I didn't know about this Title 12 legislation. I know, I, I almost thought it was But let's just think a little bit. At that time, every land grant university was funded to establish a position as land, uh, Title 12 representative on campus. And, it was, and so every university, in fact, many of them appointed those persons as associate deans for international agriculture as a part of the structure of the colleges of agriculture. And those positions were funded by USAID under Title 12. Right. Well, you, without USAID, none of this would, would be in place. Okay, I think this feeds in nicely actually to the next question that we have, which I'm going to turn to David. Um, some of you may have read this recently. David recently wrote a blog post on the difference between agricultural economics and economics. Um, so David, can you describe for us that distinction um, and provide your view on whether and how that distinction matters? Um, the ag econ versus econ for understanding the role of international research in ag econ departments. So my, my feeling is this, uh, ag econ and econ, they are close, but they are not the same. Ag econ is applied in econ, the big, uh, the big ambition, especially when it comes to theories to develop a theory and understanding and something that is very general. And then you have a lot of uh, part of applied research that really need to mix econ with other disciplines. So to me, environmental economics is useless without some environmental science. And uh, the emphasis of econ is methodology and theory, which in my view, sometimes the theory is like religion. Like some people really believe in perfect market. It's like the Catholic church, only different God. So to some extent, uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, in applied econ in, 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 and some people in economics, like if you are financial economic, it's like that, you can solve practical problems. The problem of agricon is to solve, and the challenge is to solve practical, practical problems. Now, agricon to me is not ag. Farmers don't need us realistically. We really deal with resource economics, some development economics, some rural development, some consumer economics. We develop a lot of applied theory. To me, that's probably the most important thing. We train people to work in extension and it's all the time changing. Extension, in my view, could work a lot with farmers. They could work with consultants and sometimes with farmers. 
but to some extent it's an evolving game where the big emphasis should be about practical issue. Now, what is the role of development? And I will, if I have time, I'll speak about my very critical approach of development economics today. And I tell you honestly, I have something called Master of Development Practice, and I like a lot of development issues, and I work in a lot of development. I never will call myself developed economist. Personally, I don't like the, some, some what was going on with it. But the, I know that's the reality. But, uh, but, uh, but, but the basic thing is what we need to do in uh, Agricon or whatever the land grant system, and I was clear, to work on problems of agriculture, problems of agri-food supply chain, problem of rural poverty, problem of international trade, problem of development, to some extent that it relates to U.S. interest. If you speak about direct interest, like export something to developing countries or, not the, or the rest of the world, or issues of climate change. Now, climate change is a global public good, and to some extent, this is a big issue that we have to, that we have to study. Now, what I personally don't like is that we have students that do development in agricultural department and get money from the experiment station to study the, I don't know, the development of the glass industry in Thailand. It's a very good topic, but that's not something that should be an experiment station. But the last point that is very important, the land of mission is all good and nice, but when you look at the college, and I uh, administered some part of the college, Basically, you have different perspectives. You get some money from the, from the land grant system. It's not that much. At least for Berkeley, I don't know about our school. You get money from students. It's also not so much. You get some money from other agencies. I know that uh, Texas, uh, that uh, UCLA and some people in Berkeley get money from, uh, from a, a USAID. People don't speak about it, but a lot of money comes from CIA. All of African study came from CIA. So to some extent, we do a lot of things from different sources and there is a lot of place for development economics because you pay, you play. And the last thing is the element of academic freedom. If you have a student that comes to the department and he wants to do something about any topic and it's academically sound and he can get the money so he doesn't go for money that is targeted to domestic things, it's okay with me. So my feeling is that the key point is there is a narrow mission, there is much broader set of possibilities, and then there is a money. Great, thank you. Does anyone on the panel want to comment on the difference between AggieCon and Econ or respond to anything that David just mentioned? Maybe later. Okay, we'll 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 allow uh, Titus to answer the next question. So. Titus, you are um, a former department head at not just one, but two different institutions. Um, you're also, you know, in an in a upper administration role now as associate dean for research and strategic partnerships. So in your view, what is the role of agricultural economists in studying international development and how does it fit with the mission of land grant institutions? First, I want to say thank you, Sarah and Ben, for organizing this session. I think this is a very important uh, issue and topic for us to be discussing uh, because it has practical um, implications for our membership. It also has practical implications for how we are viewed in our home states uh, as uh, the institutions that are funded by the state government and the federal government. Uh, I think there are a couple of questions that I see here. One is whether the work that we're doing has direct linkages to uh, the Morrow Act uh, of 1862, uh, 1890, and subsequently 1894. Uh, I think Sally has already helped me in, in showing that yes, there is a direct uh, link there. So I think that part of what I'm going to focus on will be uh, some different angles to how I see uh, that linkage. In your introduction, you mentioned that uh, the Morrow Act was really intended to help uh, meet the need of the, popul uh, the, the U.S. population uh, uh, with practical agricultural education 
which was what it was in the beginning, but then we have research was added to that, an extension was added to that in a way that is relevant to the practical needs of the people. Uh, when I think about that mission, I see a very strong alignment uh, with the scope of work that is done in international development. Uh, in international development, a lot of what we're trying to do really aligns well with that. Uh, without thinking about the source of the funding now, because that's a totally different uh, story, but they're still linked. So when I think about uh, international development and the impact of the work that we do there, um, not just agricultural development, but looking at uh, development broadly, I will say that we can look at it uh, from uh, three perspectives. A lot of our work helped to develop a global hu uh, human capacity. Uh, in various ways. We also help to develop local institutions, uh, political institutions, economic institutions, even social institutions in order to facilitate, and I think this part is very important because it's in the US interest in a broader sense, to help facilitate global resilience uh, to mitigate fragility. A lot of US funds today is going to support countries to ensure stability and fight uh, terrorism. But terrorism is not a, uh, a problem that is isolated from many other things. Uh, it has to do with a lot of the basic needs of the people in those countries. And as we can see, that is interconnected uh, with uh, food security in the United States and political uh, security in the United States too. And totally, the work we do in international development uh, also help to develop uh, the knowledge base for generating uh, innov uh, innovative solutions uh, to address global uh, grand challenges. And that includes issues of cl uh, climate, uh, food insecurity, hunger, uh, and nutrition issues. So these categories of what we do in agricultural development or development economics, broadly speaking, aligns really well with uh, the, the land grant missions. I think where uh, th the question really lies is how that is linked with what we do in our own institutions, in our departments and, and in our colleges. I think that's where the challenges are. In my roles in two institutions, we always fight this battle with the Dean's office and with the university at large to show that uh, the work that our folks who are interested in international development are doing are relevant and should be funded by funds from the university and the state. Uh, as David mentioned earlier, I think it's very critical that those of us who are engaged in international development work in agriculture should emphasize the agriculture part and always find ways to show the direct and indirect linkages to the welfare of the taxpayers. I think that's very important. And that's the discussion we should be having uh, uh, more. Uh, the last one I'm gonna make is to just give an example uh, that ties in with the point that Sally made earlier. I also believe that the, the land grant mission was expanded after World War II uh, because Prior to World War II, most activities of the land grant were really focused on the United States. But after World War II, uh, you have the attack on Pearl Harbor and we realized that maybe we're not so far away from the rest of the world. And when that happened, everything became more linked together. Uh, the rebuilding of Europe and then uh, helping to, to expand democracy and food security in developing countries and expanding markets for U.S. producers became a bigger issue. And lastly, uh, Michigan State plays a very big role here. And this goes back to our 12th president, uh, uh, President John Hanna. Right after World War II, he articulated a very clear vision to the university and to the state of Michigan uh, that the university not, uh, should not only uh, focus on the needs of the people of Michigan, but should rather look at the rest of the world. So Michigan State invested a lot of resources then in helping to build institutions, uh, specifically universities in Brazil, in Colombia, and Okinawa in the 1950s. And then in the 1960s, as African countries began to uh, get their, uh, their freedom from their colonial masters, uh, Michigan State University went to 
to several uh, 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 countries, especially Nigeria, the very first land grant institution on the African continent was established by Michigan State in collaboration with the government of Nigeria uh, at Unsuka in Nigeria in the early 1960s. So these are examples of how colleges of agriculture uh, in fulfillment of the land grant mission have done a lot in the past to show an expanded vision and mission uh, of, of the land grant. All right, thank you. Um, before opening it up for comment, I think I'm gonna go straight to a question for Alex. You're, you're our last one that hasn't said anything. <laughs> so Alex, um, you're the director of the Illinois Agricultural Experiment Station right now. You're also acting associate dean of research um, at an, a tremendous land grant institution. <laughs> um, and you're the associate dean of international programs. So you're doing a lot at the college level. So I'm asking you for your college level perspective. Um, how and why is international development research important for a college of agriculture at a land grant university? Thank you very much, Sarah. And, and thank you for letting me be part of this panel. Um, just so I can say, I'm really sure Illinois was ahead of you at Njala and Sierra Leone. <laughs> it, it had to be within weeks. <laughs> um, in, in terms of the land grant mission and work in international development, I think conceptually, it, it's very easy to, to affirm what Titus just said. Um, I think most land grant universities say their mission is something along the lines of creating and disseminating knowledge uh, to address socially significant grant challenges related to food and agriculture. Uh, and those socially significant challenges are almost always transnational. If it's climate change, if it's geopolitical security, if it's phytosanitary, whatever. Um, they're almost always transnational, so it makes sense to have international research to address those problems um, from the perspective of domestic welfare. Um, uh, so that conceptual argument, I think, is, is pretty clear. Uh, it might be creating new markets. It might be uh, protecting ourselves from FMD, whatever. Uh, there's a, a challenge or perceived challenge, I think, when we talk about the institutional argument, right? And, and can we use Hatch dollars for it? Can we use Smith-Lever funding for it? Um, so since I'm now director of a state agricultural experiment station, I read the Hatch Act recently. <laughs> um, and it is very, very explicit. Uh, I, could, I could quote it here, but basically it's the object and duty of people like me uh, to make sure that these funds are used. Uh, how's it framed? Contributing to the establishment and maintenance of the permanent and effective agricultural industry in the United States. So Hatch dollars are supposed to contribute to this permanent effective agricultural industry in the United States. Um, all right. So if there's transnational threats to the ag industry, then we ought to be using hatch dollars without any question to address whatever. I think my first funded, as an assistant professor, my first funded, NIFA funded project was looking at FMD in Argentina to try to make an argument as to whether it was more cost effective for the US livestock sector to protect itself from FMD at the border or in Argentina, right? And I think there's lots of cases where you can make that sort of direct biophysical argument uh, for ag production. Um, is alleviation of poverty in a developing country in the interest of US agriculture? You can make a market development argument. Uh, you could make a geopolitical argument. Um, you could make a humanitarian argument. American taxpayers pay money for poverty alleviation, so clearly their welfare is enhanced by effective poverty alleviation uh, abroad. Um, what I think is sometimes overlooked uh, by directors of ag experiment stations is that NIFA is very explicit that those are legitimate uses of, of NIFA, National Institute for Food and Agriculture dollars. Um, I checked their website before I came today. Uh, and, and the NIFA website says our impact comes from helping countries to improve their agricultural markets and increase their food production. So we are not necessarily miffed that Argentina develops a 
sound soybean industry. Uh, maybe that isn't eating our lunch. Maybe it's just creating a bigger lunch for soybean producers globally. Um, the NIFA website, I was stunned at how progressive <laughs> the NIFA website is. Uh, helping developing countries improve their agricultural economies is something that they say they invest in, right? Um, so if you happen to be in an agri-applied or food and resource department in a land-grant university, uh, whether or not it's investing resources in international development research is not because of its funding from NIFA. It's not because of the Hatch Act restricting it from doing it. Uh, it's because that institution chooses to do it or not do it. Uh, so I did some more homework. I told you I was gonna do homework. I, I had called to check websites of our various departments. And I went through 24 websites of ag econ departments, allied departments, just to see what their opening statement is. And in our opening statement of who we define ourselves as a department, how often do we mention the global or the international or, or development? This was not scientific, and I know that the opening mission statement on your website is not the best, you know, descriptor of a department, but it's something. Uh, and what I found was, out of my 24, 16 were yeses. 16 indicated preparing people for a global environment, dealing with global food and agriculture issues, something global or international in their two-sentence mission statement, and eight didn't. Um, now, I come from an institution that does and always has, and to me, I, I never had to argue very much about this. Uh, so I kind of wondered why some do and some don't. Uh, and, and I, through my non-rigorous reflection on this, decided first, if your ag stakeholders are globally focused, you're likely to put the word global in your mission statement. The Corn Belt campuses generally put global in it, right? Um, if your consumer stakeholders are globally focused, you're likely to have global in it. So places with big cities, <laughs> we're more likely to have global in their statement, right? So not surprising, Illinois uh, has always had global in its, in its focus, right? Um, and, and the third thing that I would think, and I think this gets to what David said, if your funding base is highly reliant on the state, you're less likely to have global in that statement. And if you aspire to be competitive for national or international funding in a competitive way, then you are more likely <laughs> to have global in that mission. So I think, you know, what does international development belong in the research portfolio of a land grant university or of an ag econ department? Well, it does depend a little bit on the state and the aspirations of that department. Um, I'll make one forecast. And my forecast is it's gonna get easier and easier to make the argument uh, because global climate change is, is making the global more of an issue for ag stakeholders everywhere. Um, but also because uh, Every university that I know of is looking at the same demographic cliff for enrollment. Uh, that there aren't enough 17 year old Americans. <laughs> and, and so every land grant university that I know of is looking to broaden its enrollment base either by non traditional older students or international recruitment. And you can do that a lot more effectively if you can actually show that you know something about international context that people hate to, ha have to go back to. Um, so that's, that's the homework I did, Sarah, based on your question. Um, sure, can I follow up? I, I okay. think David is okay. dying to follow up. <laughs> well, I don't know, no, I don't know. No, I think that you raise a really important point and to be honest about it, there is a big difference between the land grant and the attack. I was running the Janini Foundation every time that I did anything related to development, I got my head, I got slapped. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we do a lot of development. So the key element, the ATLAC become less and less part of the support for the system. 
Okay. Now, if you look at uh, the way that universities look at global student fairs, they are export. We export education. Most of, most of the PhD program have now more and more international students, and they pay quite a lot of money. So if we look at the overall economics, obviously, development economics is very important part. So my feeling is this. Should it be in part of a ag and resource economics department? No doubt about it. How would you pay about it? This is, this is a different story. Now, a lot of time you have to go to your dean and you have to educate them about economic rather than about the, uh, the ag act. If you can get only local students and you're doing well and you are not interested in anything in plant biology, great. In our department, we wouldn't have an agricultural department if it would be a global department, if it wouldn't allow, and we will use all the money possible. One thing I learned, and I'm sure that uh, you know it better than me, you need to try to get as many resources as, as possible. So to me, a key element is to distinguish. Now, the other thing is the issue intellectually, we are in a globalized world, we have climate change, research and development is global, I think that 30 years ago, it was worthwhile to argue that uh, agriculture is an export in industry. Now it's quite trivial. It's not that you only uh, provide the sell agricultural product, probably will make more money from selling technology. So from the business side, it also makes sense. But again, for a lot of people, it's not the attack. So what I find, and I speak about California, that you a lot of time when you are an administrator, you have to speak with people, that have a lot of power that have America first in line. So if you don't want to have a fight about I am for it or I'm against it, you go around it. And you go around it by using other sources of funding. Mm -hmm. oh, Sarah mentioned when she introduced me that I had talked a lot when I first arrived at Illinois about the land grant mission and had our dean speak and our CFO speak about it, who's Paul Ellinger, used to be department head. And what makes Illinois a little bit different nowadays, and I don't know about all the state funding models, is that there's no separate colors of money anymore that come to departments. It all comes in one pipe from campus, and, and the metrics that determine how much money you get are, are arcane. But um, it appears they're student-based, but they are and they aren't. Um, it, it's not well understood. But uh, in my Rip Van Winkle type experience, when I was at Illinois from the 80s and the 90s and early 2000s, um, it was very important what color of money you had on your um, each person's appointment, whether how much experiment station appointment you had, how much extension appointment, and associate deans were very jealous of each other and guarded when those, their monies and that kind of thing. Well, and, and in, in some ways it's much simpler now that we don't have those colors of money. But on the other hand, the new faculty and, uh, that have come in in the last 20 years don't necessarily have an understanding of what it means to have an experiment station appointment or an extension appointment because they don't see dollars associated with that in their salary. Now they may get some hatch money from Alex and they could go to a trip and, and maybe have a grad student occasionally, but they don't really see how that differentiates our College of Agriculture and Consumer Environmental Sciences from the business school or the liberal arts, what have you, because we look like them in terms of the money coming through this one pipe. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted, I was more concerned, um, and I didn't want to start off my remarks this way, not that people um, were, um, didn't under, they didn't understand the land grant mention as understanding the service we were obligated to provide to the state as part of being a state of Illinois land grant. And so no one would argue that we, we shouldn't be doing international development, all sorts of good reasons to do it. But the argument had to be made, we need to be working for the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. And that was the tough sell. And I think that's still a little bit of a tough sell in the department. Um, so I'm not here to talk to you guys about you just stop working in Africa and go, you know, go work in downstate Illinois. But um, we don't have anybody working in downstate Illinois. None. <laughs> No one. Our new department head may get somebody working in downstate Illinois. 
I bet she will. But th this is that's the genesis of where my interest in the land grant it wasn't to say don't, stop doing the development work. It was think about what the balance should be going. What to David was saying of of our portfolio, and I, I thought it was a little bit out of well, it was uh, ambiguous. I think. I'm going to add a few comments to you. Uh, I think that there are uh, things that we discuss at the philosophical level, and there are things that we have to discuss at the most practical level. And I think when I, uh, I uh, look at international development, I see the tension between what uh, the university or uh, stakeholders across the state view as the role of international de uh, development in a state level or state funded uh, uh, institution uh, like Illinois, Michigan State, or, or even the UC system. We've had challenges uh, getting deans, for example, to see international development beyond uh, a catch cow that brings in funds from external sources to help balance the budget. Uh, I think that that is a critical issue. And that also shows up when you go talk to people uh, at the Farm Bureau. People at the Farm Bureau, yes, they care about the export market. But beyond that, if you say, oh, we have people that are helping to, to uh, do analysis of uh, uh, land tenure and land structure in developing countries, you have to go one step further to show them how that links to, to the market for their products. Or else they go like, why aren't you spending time in Michigan and, and doing this and doing that? So I think it's very important uh, that we also emphasize education uh, and continuous education and communication uh, with our stakeholders in a way that shows the linkages and the connection between what they're interested in and what our faculty uh, are doing. And the last point I'll make is this. In practical terms, yes, we all believe that international development is part of the mandate of uh, the expanded mandate of land grant institutions. But when you go to our colleges and our departments and you look at the number of courses that are taught in that area or the number of faculty relative to the total number of faculty in the departments and the colleges that actually have appointment in that area or are actually doing work in that area, I'll say that the numbers are quite low. We have a few uh, outliers like Illinois and Michigan State and Cornell, but you look at the... What about Berkeley? And what about Berkeley? Berkeley? Yeah. <laughs> what about, that's not an outlier. That's, that's, that's actually the yeah. picture almost everywhere. Yeah. So, so you have a few outliers, maybe five to six uh, large programs, but many of our medium-sized or smaller programs are struggling in terms of supporting uh, education and research in that area. Can I, can I make one point? I, I think that one thing that we forgot, which is really cool, most crucial cool mm -hmm. thing, is what is the way that we look today at faculty. Faculty is judged by output. And when judged by output, they judge where they publish, how they publish, and that's the issue of economics versus agriculture. So if you look at development economics today, today in development economics, you do what economics do. They decided to do some, and what I consider to be excessive use of mostly trivial experiments. And then everyone in Agicon does trivial experiments. Agicon was, no, Agicon was doing in the past big picture thinking, the Rutan. I don't see, we have three people in the World Food Summit that were above 70. I don't know any young guys in all that know anything about ag, but they know about statistics. So to me, the big issue is when you're a faculty member, you want to have tenure. And people say if you publish in AR, it's great. But if you publish in AJ, it's okay. And if you publish in Journal of uh, Plant Breeding, it's terrible. So my feeling is the key issue in agriculture department, if you really want domestic and international to recognize things that are ag, and related and are multidisciplinary and not to be blind after economics. That is the, the, the key. Everything else is, go, is, is different. Is, is, is different. Now, the other thing, in big, in big states that 
development is an export good. And honestly, Michigan State, I reviewed it many, many times. They make money from, they will have a development program. It's a great program to attract a lot of students that are interested and intellectually it's challenging. In other universities, it's up to them. But to me, the key issue for us is to be a viable discipline all by ourselves. And then we will have much better development, much better agriculture, and we will respond to our, to, to our, uh, to our pair. If you're in California, Fresno is a developing country. The state of Mississippi <laughs> is very respected developing country. So to some extent, if you look at it, development economic has a lot of role to play. But if you want to play the game of economics, and that's the only game in town, we are in trouble. All right, thank you. Um, I think, yeah, I think we should open it up to questions from the audience. Um, so if you want, you can direct a question directly to somebody, or you can direct it to the whole panel. Um, if I'm going to ask the panelists to repeat the question since we don't have a mic so that the people online can um, hear them. So we'll start, we'll start here and then we'll go to Travis in the back. Sure. I'm just curious. Uh, I'll open this up to whoever wants to talk. But this, both the land grant mission and how we interpret international development research. Era when the United States had very rich funding. We were Bretton Woods, this was post colonial era came on, Cold War. And so I haven't heard any comment here about the Cold War rationale for international That helps to explain what we were up to. But the composition of both geopolitics and the U.S. David and I were at a session of the <laughs> My feeling is this, we really don't, what happened is that we have a the main role of the, uni, uh, of the university research now is to educate students, to educate the uh, practitioners and to, and to develop the frontier, biotechnology, environment. The private sector in America can do a lot of things that the public sector did in the past. We have a session on, uh, on Apple. The Apple industry in Washington does the same thing as the private sector is doing. So to eventually they will give less money for the applied research for the extension type work that works producing a new apple variety and more to look at public good research and to train people that are top notch in, in, in applied research. We are in a totally different stage than China or Brazil. In China and Brazil, they don't have the private sector that does it. So my feeling is that we have to continue and even support public research more, but it has to be more on the frontier, on the public good and on advanced biology and how you integrate different types of bioeconomy, all these other things. And in this regard, I feel very good. If you look at what the US is doing, we really deal with the frontier. If you look at what Europe is doing, they fight the frontier. And if you look at China and other countries are in between. If you look at our public and private research, and a lot of our private research is not considered research, but a lot of the private expenditure is actually building infrastructure. We are not doing that badly. What we really need, what we are really needing is better human capital to help the companies to move forward. 
and we need better international relationships so we will be able to export our technology and in the meantime, in my view, save the world. But I think these are the issues. And to me, the key challenge of uh, land grant colleges is to be attractive to students more than anything else. If you don't have good students, you're useless. And that is our number one problem. I think that from the examples that you mentioned, um, especially the Cold War, um, the key driver that we all agree uh, uh, behind the, the level of funding and support for international development is politics. Uh, yes, it's the combination of the political economy uh, 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 factor, but I think lately when you look at the United States, uh, relative to how things were uh, maybe a few decades ago, the politics is translating to a more protectionist and more inward looking uh, electorate. And because it's a representative uh, uh, democracy, the electorate drives the, uh, the motivation and the actions of the politicians that allocate funds. I think that is being reflected uh, in the level of funding that has flattened, actually declining uh, as a percentage of GDP is very low. Uh, I think another point that was made uh, just now by David is an important one. I think there is a, a slight difference in the, uh, the interaction between government uh, and private sector in terms of funding uh, and support for, for international development work. I think that there is probably a more robust uh, uh, interest in the global economy by the large multinationals uh, in the US and of course in other places too. Uh, I think the, the political mindset about the size of government and the role of government uh, has been driving the decline that we see uh, in support for international development. And if that is to change, there needs to be better communication and education of the US uh, electorate about our interdependence on the rest of the world, uh, that we are linked to the rest of the world and, the, and that the US cannot uh, take the posture of we are big enough and we're so strong that we can go at it without the rest of the world. Well, let me just make a couple poorly informed points. Um, I see somebody here from Purdue University. I'm gonna mention something. When I was at Purdue, um, spent a lot of money and got a lot of money from the government uh, in Afghanistan. And, uh, and now I know we're mostly talking about research, but all these things are usually bundled up with research education and outreach and all that stuff. And, um, you know, it was money down a hole. I mean, money it, it was not uh, turned out to uh, amount to anything despite blood, sweat, and toil for how many years of Purdue investing faculty time and effort in Afghanistan. It's, it's, I think it's gone to nothing. Um, so and why was that? It was for, obviously we we're doing it for uh, political, uh, global reasons, but, and, and everybody had the right, oh, I don't even know if they had the right interest. They tried to convert things to a market-based economy and do, things that were just never going to work. So, you know, there's a sense we're not talking about all successes out there. And, and I think the, the, some of the failures that have been out there have also maybe impacted where we are now on some of this. Um, Alex, I'm going to hand this over to Alex now. I don't know what the portfolio mix is, but it sure seems there's a lot of private foundation money too. And we haven't talked about that, Gates and Mercy and all, all those NGOs and how big they are in that overall agricultural development and research portfolio. I don't know, I'm sure USAID is still the 800 pound gorilla, but there are other, there are other um, objectives out there and NGOs that are push and foundations that are pushing um, uh, this uh, research agenda. So, I think that's a great question, a great comment. Before I get to it, I want to go back one. Uh, one of my previous roles as, as Director for International Agriculture at Illinois, 
was to say no Be, because there are a lot of opportunities to take funding to do things that really aren't a land-grant university's job um, and, and maybe that experience in Afghanistan is a little bit like that uh, and I was really fortunate to have a dean who was also ready to say no when it felt like somebody wanted to put wanted to put the University of Illinois on something that really wasn't within our mission and likely to, to do good, uh, which is hard. It's hard to say no <laughs> to ICR. Um, I think the privatization of agricultural research, which is something that's been going on for 20 years now, I think if you look at the trends, I didn't see the talk earlier, but I think the trend goes back for about 20 years, is a important phenomenon. I was going to say distressing, but I don't want to I don't want to over dramatize. Um, it, it has clear implications for right the rate and bias of technical change in this country and, and globally, and that's important. Um, when, when you look at then the portfolio of publicly funded agricultural research, it becomes increasingly important that what we do within that portfolio is in the public good, because we used to have a lot of right private benefit in our public research portfolio. And if we were to segregate those better, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. It, I mean, it'd be a good thing. Um, and then that gets to then, how do we affect the public research investment portfolio? Right. Um, and uh, in my brief experience uh, trying to do that, what, what I've discovered is a little paradoxical, which is it works better if you have a private sector person with you making the argument to the policymaker, right? Uh, and so how do you, how do you ensure that uh, the, the public research portfolio is funded by the guy in the state legislature is by making sure this, the ag stakeholder is there with you saying, yeah, it's a good idea. How do you simultaneously make sure that it's in the public interest and not highly distorted by that stakeholder? Um, I think that's a challenge before us that I don't have the answer to, but. And that's great. And so, like, you know, like Titus, when you, you advocate for research, international researchers to make a better job making the pitch that it matters that it's relevant to California. So, and, and that's great. I, I, I guess I want to hear if we've all been in a position where the department head or faculty has brand new hire who's working in development. And what is what does all of that mean for their research plan? That I think is like where the rubber hits the road because um, they have to decide how how invested are they going to become as research? Like how invested are they in the metrics that will determine their success and evaluate their performance in development space? Relative to what they what they're told are the metrics uh, that are expected of them for in a land grant. I would love to hear your comments on that, and just just to kind of give a little bit more background to that. When I so I arrived at UCLA about two decades ago, um, I didn't understand the the, the like how these all these things work together. But what I did what was very what made very clear to me was that I needed to have a domestic. I always needed to have at least one domestic research project in the work. Now for me that actually worked out quite well because um, it was sort of distortionary at first, but but it actually opened up some interesting. Complementary to my international work, and so I don't. I don't have any regrets for being told that I had to modify, and I, I certainly didn't object on grounds of policy. You know, so that's what I have to pick up when I speak to policy general generals and stuff. Um, a few years later, Michael Carter came into our department, and Michael Carter's response was, "I don't want any strings attached. I got plenty of funding." So there was this really complicated, convoluted negotiation to opt out of tax funding for him. So he, so, so this was like a very different junior response versus senior response here. Um, 
And so I'd love to hear your perspectives on like how how much often do you detect their income your back or from consumer spending, whether they're institutional or from the perspective, or should we just like accept that that's part of that's the that's that's part of the territory and they're expected to to pull their weight with respect to the stakes they're in. Okay, I, I tell you, this is not you. This is when I came to Berkeley, they told me you publish too many joint papers, you have to publish stuff myself, yourself. Now, I don't, if you know me, I don't like, I like to work with people, I like to bullshit too. So, <laughs> I so I so I continue to write paper together, and when I ever you're judged by academics. So to me, what people don't tell you is that the only thing that matters is the output. At the end, I don't know anyone that didn't get tenure or anything because he didn't do, do A or B or C. So to some extent, you, the key element that you need to have is confidence. Mm -hmm. and, and I know Greg. Greg is totally different than the profile of Agricon. He public, he's great. He didn't publish, he will work someplace else. Now, the one thing that is important, and this is a big challenge of leadership, is that we are the, so we are the dean that generally colleges of agriculture are below, are below anything, they're really low. So we have a dean who was a member of the National Academy of Science, and he was very good, and he came to the university and he said, gosh, we have to solve real problems. So forestry, we have fire. If you publish in science, you don't solve a fire, but if you publish in journal of pine trees and fire, there is a chance. So they recognize it. Now, the problem is, is the leadership. If you have a department as they say, this is what we accept. And we don't really want to be the best science magazine, but the most relevant thing, you, it will be accepted. So to some extent, a lot of time is depend how the leadership convince the university about what is relevant and what is good and what is not. As a faculty member, I think a lot, the, what I think I do, maybe it's arrogant of me, because I was a student in Giannini, I realized that 80% of the students of the faculty shouldn't be good mentors, they hardly got tenure. <laughs> so you really have to choose your mentor. Not every time that someone, because he has a title, tell you something, you have to list, you have to do the best work that take advantage of your strengths. That's my view. I'll, I'll, I'll try one. Yeah. Not to skip you too much because I'll hand it back. You know, that's a good question, and I've been at enough universities to know it varies by different universities. Um, I'm going to bring up a really boring subject, but, you know, the annual reviews of faculty are they on track? Are they meeting expectations? Is this going to count? They have to have some feedback. Yep. And, uh, at Illinois, I think people could be doing, you know, fine just doing development stuff, fine. Um, maybe we need more people working on rural Illinois. I think so, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But um, but at other places, that would be a kiss of death. You, you, you might not get tenure, but there needs to be feedback given to the assistant professor and all new hires as to what counts and what doesn't. And it, it, it varies by institution, still. If you want, who wants to answer? Uh, this is an issue that uh, I, I dealt with quite a few times. Uh, and one of the things that I communicate very early on to the new assistant professor is that uh, as an assistant professor, uh, I will help you to, to uh, I will be a, your advocate to, to different constituents, including senior faculty in the department and to the Dean's office. And I'll also answer questions that you may have very early on and I'll be proactive in telling you things you may not know you should know yet. But, but one of the things that I tell people very early on is that you need to have a portfolio uh, approach in mind when you're thinking about your research. And especially for those who are doing work in international development, I, I encourage them to, of course, do the best work uh, because the quality of the journals and the quality of the questions do matter, but you need to still have a portfolio effect too, uh, uh, approach to, to where you're publishing. But then in the topical areas, one thing that is very clear to me that 
is a, some of our best people that are interested in development work are also very good with methods. And the questions that are being asked in a developing country context has application domestically and to the state of Michigan too. So I'm saying, okay, look at your portfolio. Is it 100% international and zero application to the state of Michigan or to US issues? Uh, if you don't, if you're not the very best at what you're doing, you may have some, some problem then uh, with some people. That doesn't mean that you will not be fine, but you, you may have a little bit more headache. So if you can find, even if it's only 20% of, of your uh, output in terms of your portfolio addresses some issues that you don't have to rationalize to the stakeholders or to the members of the college level p &T committee, that really helps you and it helps me as a department chair to make a stronger case for you. So using a portfolio approach is very important and it's very important too that the department head and the senior faculty in the department provide good guidance and, and a strong advocate in making that communication or doing that communication that I mentioned earlier to the rest of the college. Just minor comments. Um, I, I think it's almost inevitable if you're an active scholar at a land grant university, even if your portfolio is 100% international development, like mine was when I was assistant professor, you end up doing things of interest to the state. Um, and so it can work out, but I, I would mostly want to reinforce what Sally said was that I think departments have a responsibility ethically and professionally to lay out what the expectations are and to stick to them and not move those goalposts. So you were told do something domestic every year, whatever. I was told write the monthly African studies newsletter for the next five years. Uh, um, <laughs> um, it, it, and as long as it's explicit and held in place and there's annual check-ins, I, I, think, I think people are, are holding up their sides of the bargain. focus tends to be on, you know, when you have more anxious students, whatever. So in some ways, it's almost nothing. It's, it's a challenge to try to, you know, push against that. I don't know if other departments Before David jumps in, there's some really great dual career situations that can really help out. Yes, you have to be open. You got it. You got to be lucky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think one thing, like, like I look at Tom Reardon, he's a good friend of mine, and his development of his agribusiness. Yeah. See, to me, the biggest myth of agricon is that we cater too much to farmers that become less and less significant, and we don't care to the supply chain. And if you look at agribusiness, if you have someone good in agribusiness, it will do things international. So as I said before, to me, the field of development needs to be a little bit more part of a global field. And you can hire people in agribusiness. The, the suicide that I see, I was reviewing many Midwestern departments. All the students go to agribusiness and the people that teach it are lecturer and the people that teach agricon or whatever, you have three students that are nerds that at the end will be in computer science. <laughs> so that, 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 that to me is, uh, so why don't you hire people that are agribusiness? So you don't publish in a journal, you publish in a business journal. Mm -hmm. So to me, the biggest challenge is where do we want to be five years from now? Mm -hmm. Do we, we will be do the same stuff or we'll do a little bit of supply chain and biodiversity and work with other disciplines? Mm -hmm. so, so, so to some extent, I would really raise topics in direction rather than say, gosh, this guy retired, let's replace, let's have a replica of it. It wouldn't work with replicas. 
the only thing I will add to that uh, is that uh, one advice I've been giving to uh, graduate students in the job market, because we have a good number of students who, who are interested in development from our program, is that instead of being, uh, being too general in listing your areas of expertise as international development, why don't you have some more specific areas in development that you work in. So if you're in environmental and resource economics, why don't you include that? You could say de development, but also list that. If you're in agribusiness, also list that because that makes you more appealing uh, and it makes you more relevant for more openings in the field. Uh, as you mentioned, we have some, some folks that for a job that is asking for an environmental economist, even though they have interest in developing countries, they have the skills uh, and they have the, the capability to teach those courses and do research domestically and globally. So I, I think uh, the narrative really matters and how we tell the stories of what we do uh, does matter too, so that we can have more people that we hire that can do development, but can also teach those courses. Because one of the challenges that uh, I've had, and I'm sure that other department chairs have had this, is that we think holistically uh, in the department about research, teaching, and extension, especially department chairs. But a lot of times, some only think about the teaching part, especially the, the associate deans for, 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 uh, for education and, and instruction will go like, okay, who's gonna teach these courses? Well, <laughs> We want that too, but we also want people that can help with the scholarship. So being able to tell that story and know how to respond to the needs of the college will be very uh, cru crucial moving forward. Hmm. You better answer the question. I just want to go back. You want to go? I have, I'm happy to defer to you. Yeah. I'm happy to Actually, that's a challenge that we have uh, right now. Uh, and we look at uh, the numbers, go back 20 years ago, and you look at the composition of graduate students at Michigan State University, you see a significant representation uh, of African students. We don't have that anymore. Uh, we're struggling to attract African students because of the source of funding and the level of funding that is available. Uh, so there's been a shift there. Uh, now we are trying to do some things to change that, but it has been an uphill battle. So it is the problem. Uh, but one of the things though that we're finding as uh, uh, prospects for the future that may help us in this area is actually working with our partners in the developing countries, because it's not the story that we, uh, of how things were 30, 40 years ago. Uh, there are strong partners on the African continent and in Asia that are willing to support their students uh, to come to our institutions if we create pathways and creative ways to collaborate with them. Some of them want to do dual degree programs. Some of them wants to have contracts that will have the students come over here for two or three years and then do their research in country. So we have to be open to alternative funding models that are uh, uh, in partnership with the countries where we used to get uh, the bulk of our students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
no, I, I just say the same thing that um, having stronger partners abroad makes different models possible, even as AID and USDA have cut off funding for degree programs for degree funding for, for graduate students from those countries. Um, and it, it is good that institutions in foreign countries and developing countries now have agency to pick where they send their students and the terms under which they send them, but they tend to send them to cheaper places. Um, and, and that's a, a challenge. I, th I think that the fundamental problem of the Ag Institute, we don't call ourselves Ag Institute, Natural Resources Institute, they're not sexy. And we don't have domestic students and we don't have, so to some extent we have to scrap and that's the reason that you move to environment and then we move to biotech and that's the reason that agribusiness is so popular. So I think one of the things that we have in my view that our faculty is too stubborn to do what they did 15 years ago rather than fit because there are huge opportunities in agriculture. There is, there is something called bioeconomy that I thought that we will embrace because there are a lot of jobs and opportunities. There are a lot of other things. I think to me, a lot of time going to developing countries is an easy solution. Now it's not that easy because they ca caught up. So my feeling is that we really need to develop programs that really will catch up with the time. And in a way, it's good that we have new faculty members that can really change the program. Traditional development wouldn't be the same as traditional agricon wouldn't be the same. We really have to change and work with other disciplines, recognize that today, five years from now, all this econometric will be useless because everyone developed data science and people want, want degree in data science. Mm -hmm. So we realize what is our strengths and instead of accommodating the existing faculty member, we try to see what is the demand and how we can go there. And even when it comes to developing countries, I started something called Master and Development Practice, which is a master program people pay a lot. It's MBA in sustainability. It's a program that makes money. There is demand for something like this. Mm -hmm. so, so to some extent, our department didn't want it. We don't want to have MBA students. They're not sophisticated enough. So to some extent, we are in business. And as economists, you need to know that demand change and you have to create your own demand by knowing what the consumer preferences are. Mm -hmm. That's good. Are there any questions? We're out of time. Okay. Ben says that we're out of time. He's the one that was going to keep time for us. Um, can everyone please give uh, our panelists a huge round of applause? Um, thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Um, this was a pleasure. <laughs>